Um, tonight, I'm on 108, and tonight you'll probably be able to follow me if you have the book, because I won't be jumping around too much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the home and how to bring your children to Jesus. And of course, it'll be, it'll be um, the spirit of prophecy and Bible, because that's where I got all my ideas from. Um, I raised my children uh, just on my own. When they were, when my, I have um, a boy and a girl who are a year apart, and then I have another little girl eight years later. <coughs> and uh, when my first two were just one and two, I started reading um, Child Guidance. And I didn't read very far, and I began to realize who can do this. Have you read it? Have you felt the same way? Who can do this? And so I didn't continue reading. And so the rest of the, the years that I brought up my children until my little girl was 13, uh, I just did whatever I could think to do from what I'd grown up with and so forth. And my husband and I had many an argument about how to raise the children. I felt I knew a little more about it than he did because he had grown up in a home where everybody sort of did their own thing, even though there were six of them, but they were all three years apart. And uh, I had grown up in a home where we were always together. We were on a farm. We worked together. We did things together. And I was the second mother. I was second oldest. I loved children. And so my job was always taking care of children. And so I thought I knew a little more about it. And I'd gotten along very well with my brothers and sisters. They all loved me. In fact, uh, when I was finished grade 11, they didn't have a school. They didn't have a teacher where... I, where my brothers and sisters were going to school, and I had just um, left there a year ago. I had finished grade 10 there. It was just a little country school, about 20 children, and they had no teacher, and I was on my way to academy. And uh, the community begged me, stay home and teach, because during those years they were very short on teachers, and high school graduates could teach. Well, I wasn't even a high school graduate, but the government let me teach, and I stayed home to teach. And uh, I had seven brothers and sisters in my classroom of 21 children. <laughs> but you know, I had no trouble with them. They loved me. They obeyed me because they loved me. And so when I had my own children, I, I thought I knew better than my husband how to deal with children. And uh, so we had many an argument about it. Not going to God in prayer, even though he was a minister. Not praying with our children if they needed it. No, just using human ways to deal with them, as so many Adventists do. Amen. How sad, right? How very sad. When we have so much help. But you see, all of that help that is there in child guidance and Adventist home is too hard to do unless you know how to yield your spirit to be controlled by God's spirit. It's too hard. I know one lady who read child guidance from cover to cover and she said, I cried the whole time I was reading it because I knew I couldn't do it. And nobody showed her how. And that's our problem in our church. Amen. We haven't known how to have a living relationship with a God who has all power Amen. to help us in every problem. Mark 10, 13 through 16. <clears throat> I think you all know the text very well. And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. 
But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for of such belongs the kingdom of God. And he took them in his arms, I'm missing a few texts there, and he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. And of course, ministers do that today, don't they? They have child dedication. But to dedicate a child is almost useless if the parents are not also dedicated to God and can keep that child dedicated. You see? Because a child doesn't know how to stay dedicated, a little baby. And so the parents have to know how to keep it dedicated. It's just like if you're baptized and then you do your own thing, does that keep you? No. No. You have to stay. You see, baptism represents death to self and sin and a new life altogether. And if you don't stay in that new life, you're going back to self and sin. You're either alive to God or alive to self, one or the other, every day. In Review and Herald, March 28, 1893, read the whole article. It's very revealing. And maybe I should read the whole article. <coughs> now, I won't read all of it. I'll just read some of it. Many parents will have to render an awful account at last for their neglect of their children. They have fostered and cherished their evil tempers by bending to their wishes and will when the wishes and will of the children should bend to them. They have brought God's frown upon them and their children by these things. Children are left to come up instead of being trained up. The poor little children are thought not to know or understand a correction at 10 or 12 months of age. You see, we're talking about tiny children. And they begin to show stubbornness very young. Parents suffer them to indulge in evil tempers and passions without subduing or correcting them. And by so doing, they cherish and nourish these evil passions until they grow with their growth and strengthen with their strength. Ellen White says, the moment you see your tiny baby using its will, the battle with Satan begins. And that baby cannot fight Satan. You must fight Satan for that child. Parents stand in the place of God to their children. And they will have to render an account whether they have been faithful to the little few committed to their care. Parents, some of you are rearing children to be cut down by the destroying angel unless you speedily change your course and be faithful to them. God cannot cover iniquity, even in children. And it's talking about tiny children also. Will you suffer? He cannot save them in the time of trouble if they manifest passion. Will you suffer your children to be lost through your neglect? Unfaithful parents. Their blood will be upon you, and is not your salvation doubtful with the blood of your children upon you? Children who might have been saved had you filled your place and done your duty as faithful parents should? <coughs> parents, it is your duty to have your children in perfect subjection, having all their passions and evil tempers subdued. Children, and listen to this very carefully, children are the lawful prey of the enemy. What are children when they're born? The lawful prey of the enemy, because they are not subjects of grace, have not experienced the cleansing power of Jesus, 
and the evil angels have access to these children. And it's going to tell us what to do to put them under grace. And some parents are careless and suffer them to work with but little restraint. Parents have a great work to do in this matter by correcting and subduing their children and then bringing them to God and claiming his blessing upon them. By the faithful and untiring efforts of the parents, and the blessing and grace entreated of God upon the children, the power of the evil angels will be broken. How do you break the power of the evil angels that have access to your children? By bringing the children into subjection, subduing them, and praying to God to send his Holy Spirit upon them. You see, John the Baptist's mother did that already in her when the child was still in her womb. The power of the evil angels will be broken as sanctifying influence is shed upon the children and the powers of darkness must give back. Who has to fight the enemy for the children? The parents. The parents. When the destroying angel was to pass through Egypt to destroy the firstborn of man and beast, the command to Israel was to gather their children and families into their houses with them and then mark their doorposts with blood that the destroying angel might pass by their dwellings. And if they failed to do to go through this process, there was no difference made between them and the Egyptians. You see, we have a part. We have a part. Always we have a part in our salvation and in our, our children's salvation. The destroying angel is soon to go forth again, not to destroy the firstborn alone, but to slay utterly old and young, both men, women, and little children who have not the mark. Parents, if you wish to save your children, separate them from the world, keep them from the company of wicked children, for if you suffer them to go with wicked children, you cannot prevent them from partaking of their wickedness and being corrupted. It is your solemn duty to watch over your children, to choose the society at all times for them. Teach your children to obey you. Then can they more easily obey the commands of God and yield to his requirements. Don't ne let us neglect to pray with and for our children. He who said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, will listen to our prayers for them, and the seal or mark of believing parents will cover their children if they are trained up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. Then they are covered. Only then. Some parents have thought that as long as they were Christians, their children were covered. No, only if the children are in subjection and the Holy Spirit is in control. Yes. Article I'm sure they could give you a copy here. It's Review and Herald, March 3, 1893. March 28, 1893. We, we can make copies of that. For those of you that need it, we'll probably try to have it for you to, tomorrow at church. Let mothers, this is Desire of Ages 512, let mothers come to Jesus with their perplexities. They will find grace sufficient to aid them in the management of their children. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burdens at the Savior's feet. He who said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, still invites the mothers to lead up their little ones to be blessed of him. How often can you do that? Every day and every time they need it. When they need a fresh blessing, lead them to Jesus. 
and let them have a fresh blessing instead of scolding and getting angry. How sad what we have done. Even the babe in its mother's arms may dwell as under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. If we will live in communion with God, we too may expect the Divine Spirit to mold our little ones even from their earliest moments. Seven Testimonies 10. On fathers and mothers, God has placed the responsibility of saving their children from the power of the enemy. On who? Fathers and mothers. <clears throat> this is their work. A work they should on no account neglect. Those parents who have a living connection with Christ will not rest until they see their children safe in the fold. They will make this the burden of their life. You know, <clears throat> at our camp meeting in British Columbia last summer, there was a speaker who was giving the people assurance, 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 assurance every night. There was no talk about repentance, just assurance. And I just sat there frightened for my people. <clears throat> and then one night he talked about families. And he said, all of you parents here, I know many of you feel guilty because your children are out in the world. Don't feel guilty. You did your best. And I thought, oh, what is he doing? Let me read what must be done. Come in humility with a heart full of tenderness and with a sense of the temptations and dangers before yourselves and your children. By faith, bind them upon the altar. Did I do that? Oh, yes, we had worship every morning. But it was such a quick worship, it didn't bind the children on the altar. Bind them upon the altar, entreating for them the care of the Lord. Ministering angels will guard children who are thus dedicated to God. It is the duty of Christian parents, morning and evening, by earnest prayer and persevering faith to make a hedge about their children. What are you to do? Make a hedge about your children. <clears throat> they should patiently instruct them, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. Now, if you have failed your children, is there still something you can do? We are told that the first three years are the most important. <clears throat> but if you have failed your children, don't give up today. But I will talk about what we are told to do. And our children were 22, 21, and already married, the girl was. And our little girl was 13 when we found the Lord. And we found a living experience. And how can the Lord hear our prayers to put a hedge around our children when there wasn't even a hedge around us? Amen. It's serious. But the Lord could work. And we did what, what we read to do for our children. And today, our children have the hedge around them. Amen. And our children are in the fold. <clears throat> if parents would see a different state of things in their family, let them consecrate themselves holy to God. How much? Holy. holy. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And here are parents in our churches everywhere crying for their children and they aren't even wholly dedicated themselves. 
Let them consecrate themselves wholly to God. And the Lord will then devise ways and means to save their children. Isn't that a wonderful promise? The Lord will devise ways and means. He did it for us. I thank God for it. (coughs) Whereby a transformation may take place in our households. <clears throat> Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. My boy and his father were estranged from, from uh, many years back when he was just a tiny tot. And, you know, they were such insignificant things that estranged my husband from him. The boy had such a hard time in school because of his dyslexia, so he wasn't a reader, and my husband was totally a reader. That was the only thing he was interested in. He's an editor. His whole thing was books, so there was no communion there. (coughs) And then... um, Arla needed tools. He needed tools so badly because his whole abilities were on figuring things out and how to do things and how to take apart motors and learn how they ran and all of this. That was his talent. And he had no tools, so he would slip Daddy's hammer and and a screwdriver and things like this, and then he'd forget to put them away, and then he'd be forbidden to touch the tools, and, and that would cause problems and all kinds of little things, little things. Just because my husband didn't understand the child's needs. And it gradually brought problems. Well, when Tom found the Lord, he realized that he had been the cause of those problems. And he realized what he had to do. He went to the boy and he was still living at home, praise the Lord. He was 22. And Tom spent a whole hour with him acknowledging everything that he could think of where he had failed his boy. Remember it says acknowledge your guilt, confess your sins. He had been convicted and he was confessing. And then, he, I wasn't there, he, he did it privately, but he was with him for over an hour. And at the end, he shook hands with him like a man, and they were going to be friends. And they are. They are. <clears throat> and my husband said for the first time, he realized what a wonderful son he had. That boy was always very forgiving, but Daddy never made up when he punished him. And if Daddy doesn't make up when he punishes, how does the child feel? Rejection, rejection, rejection. And it got pretty deep. And even when you go to your children... Give the children lots of time for healing to take place. Don't expect some of them to immediately respond. Every child is different. Some children are deeply hurt inside by the way the parents have treated them. Others can shrug it off and doesn't bother them. <coughs> Review and Herald. July 15, 1902. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. This is the preparation day. Set your own hearts in order. What is number one? Set your own own hearts in order and work earnestly for your children. An unreserved surrender to God will sweep away the barriers that have so long defied the approaches of heavenly grace. When you take up the cross and follow Christ, when you bring your lives into conformity to the will of God, 
your children will be converted. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. <coughs> Jeremiah 31:16 and Isaiah 49:24 and 25. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the lawful captive delivered? Who is the lawful captive of Satan? Children, unless they are placed under grace. They are the lawful prey of the enemy. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save your children. Amen. But only if, only if, you can only claim that promise if you do your part. His hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And if Christian parents seek him earnestly, he will fill their mouths with arguments and for his name's sake will work mightily in their behalf in the conversion of their children. Aren't those wonderful promises? Five Testimonies, 323. Child Guidance, 557. If you have failed in your duty to your family, confess your sins before God. Gather your children about you and acknowledge your neglect. See, and that's what we did. We took the blame. We didn't know how to live God's love. Therefore, if any problems existed between us and if the children had gotten stubborn, it was our fault because we didn't deal with them in the spirit of God and with much prayer. <clears throat> when my little daughter, when, when I found the Lord and my little girl was 13, I started dealing with her very differently from the way I had dealt with her before. You know, just commanding, do this and do this and, and so forth. But she was a very good little girl to some degree, but still... In certain things, they want to do their own thing, don't they? Amen. And so, I wanted to lead her to God. <clears throat> First of all, we went and acknowledged we had, failed, we had failed her. She had quite a lot of resentment toward her daddy. And I didn't know why. Because when that little girl was born, her daddy was just, oh, looking forward to having this little one. And when I walked out of the hospital... After two days of being there and I had the baby in my arms, my husband took the baby into his arms and I drove the car home. (laughs) Because he just had such a longing to have that little baby. And when I was in the hospital in those days, you know, the father wasn't allowed to touch the baby during those days. Now they can, but not those days. And and somehow he sat, he had an affinity for that little one, and he spent a lot of time with her. We moved to the Philippines uh, when she was a year old, and he just spent a lot of time with her. And we'd have worship together as a family, and then I would stay with the older two, who were nine and ten, and he would take the little one into another room and play with her and tell her stories while I was having worship uh, with the lesson study with these older ones, and. They just had such a wonderful time, and yet as she grew up, she resented her daddy. She resisted her daddy. And he couldn't understand why. It broke his heart. And we didn't discover why until we found the Lord. One day after we had found the way, and and Lorna had begun to see the change in mom and dad, and the change in her daddy, and everything... 
And um, one day she, she came running into the room to her daddy and she said, Daddy, I don't know why I resent you. I don't have to, do I? And the ice was broken. And they've had a wonderful bond together. And then I tried to figure out, now, why did she resent him? What was behind it all? And I discovered it. As this little one was growing, I was resenting my husband for the way he was treating the son. And this little one took on my attitude toward my husband. And she didn't know where it had come from. And she didn't know how to deal with it. How sad. How sad. But after a while, Lorna went around the house singing, Something's happened to Daddy. Not the same anymore. Remember that song? She knew, and all of our children have told us, we've come all the way with God because we want what you have. And that's what children need to see, even grown-up children. Amen. They need to see a Christianity that is living and real, that has power to control the parents' hearts. Amen. If you have failed in your duty to your families, confess your sins before God. Gather your children about you and acknowledge your neglect. Tell them that you desire to bring about a reformation in the home and ask them to help you to make the home what it ought to be. Read to them the instructions, the directions given in the Word of God. Pray with them and ask God to spare their lives and to help them to prepare for a home in his kingdom. In this way, you may begin a work of reformation and then continue to keep the way of the Lord. Pray with them. Well, yes, we prayed at worship, and that was it. We, you know, some mothers go to the room at night and pray with their children. Well, we had prayer at worship morning and evening, but that was it. And if the children were disobedient or something, I had never gone to pray with them. My father and mother hadn't done it with me, and I wasn't reading the instructions that God had given to us. He's so kind to us. And so I didn't do it either. And my husband hadn't learned either. He'd grown up in a non-Adventist home. And so now when I wanted to do things right, I felt that if I would go and pray with my little girl, that she would probably resent it at the beginning. And so I didn't do that. Whenever we came across a disagreement, I would just say, Lorna, let's pray about it. But I didn't go and take her by the hand into the room and pray with her. She told me later, Mom, if you had done that, I would have resented it. And I would have resisted. Why? Because she wasn't ready to give her heart to God at that moment. And I never asked her whether she prayed. I didn't pry into her private life. I prayed. And in a day or so, you see, without any argument, without battling with a decision, I would just say, let's pray about it. And I started doing that with my husband, too. And when you do it that way, what can the Lord do? He can speak to the other heart. And when the conscience convicts, then there's no resistance, do you see? But if you try to force the decision, there's resistance, isn't there? Haven't you seen it in your children? Yes. The most natural thing to do is resist when someone commands without giving you a chance even to choose. So I, I prayed that God would convict her and that God would speak to her little heart. And years later, oh, and then a couple of days later, she would decide the way I would want her to decide without any arguing, any problem. It was just wonderful. And 
<clears throat> a couple of years later, she told me, Mom, you did the most wonderful thing for me when you sent me to God to hear my answers because I learned to listen to my conscience. But if parents just command, 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 the children don't even have time to learn how to listen to their conscience, right? <clears throat> Deal honestly and faithfully with your children. Work bravely and patiently. Fear no crosses. Spare no time or labor, burden or suffering. The future of your children will testify the character of your work. Fidelity to Christ on your part can be better expressed in the symmetrical, symmetrical character of your children than in any other way. Five testimonies, 40. And Adventist Home 32 says, One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. The measure of your Christianity is gauged by the character of your home life, the measure of your Christianity. Just as you conduct yourself in your home life, you are registered in the books of heaven. God desires you to consecrate yourself wholly to him and represent his character in the home circle. And the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 4.12, be an example not just to those people in the church. Be an example in your home. Be an example in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Be an example. How many homes are broken up? Are the parents an example of how to live peacefully with one another? How sad. But start today. Now, if your spouse is not a Christian, you will still have a very hard time. But at least your spirit can be right in the home, right? Yes. There are few parents who realize how important it is to give to their children the influence of a godly example. No other means is so effective in training them in right lines. What is the most important means? A godly example. Review and Herald, October 12, 1911. Let parents live in the home the life of Christ and the transformation in the lives of their children will testify to God's miracle working power. Discipline your children in love. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What about mothers? Can they provoke their children to anger yes. too? Yes. Oh, yes. The same goes for mothers. Do not provoke your children to anger. The father, as priest of the household, should deal gently and patiently with his children. He should be careful not to arouse in them a combative disposition. Is it easy to do that? Yes. Oh, it's very easy. Just to give quick commands and without reasoning. And you will arouse a combative disposition. He must not allow just transgression to go uncorrected. And yet there is a way to correct without stirring up the worst passions in the human heart. Let him in love talk with his children, telling them how grieved the Savior is over their course. And then let him kneel with them before the mercy seat and present them to Christ, praying that he will have compassion on them and lead them to repentance and to ask forgiveness. Such disciplining will nearly always break the most stubborn heart. But what do most parents do? 
discipline in impatience and irritation and anger. One mother said, or one father said, I couldn't even discipline my child if I didn't get angry. Discipline is not just spanking. Discipline is correcting them in this way also. And only if they cannot be corrected in this way do they need other punishment. <clears throat> Never should parents cause their children pain by harshness or unreasonable exactions. Harshness drives souls into Satan's net. What does harshness do for children? Drive them to Satan. Is that why so many of our Adventist children are out in the world? Should we just lay aside our guilt? Or should we do something about it? We better do something about it. We better not just claim the promise without doing our part. Amen. Some children will soon forget a wrong that is done to them by father and mother, but other children who are differently constituted cannot forget severe, unreasonable punishment, which they did not deserve. Oh, how many children are punished, and they didn't... Trying so hard to keep the tail from being kicked from between my legs, and, and the cow had a sore udder and she was trying so hard to kick because it was hurting her and all of a sudden the whole pail of milk went in the gutter and my father came with a rope and both the cow and I got it I was a very forgiving child it did not do to me what it does to some children. But for some children, a root of bitterness would have come in there that they would never be able to let go unless they find Jesus. See... Some children will soon forget a wrong that is done to them by father and mother, but other children who are differently constituted cannot forget severe, unreasonable punishment, which they did not deserve. Thus their souls are injured and their minds bewildered. And remember, you are in the place of God to your children. How do they feel about the Father in heaven? How did your children feel about the Father in Heaven when they were growing up? When children lose their self-control and speak passionate words, the parents should for a time keep silent, neither reproving nor condemning. At such times, silence is golden and will do more to bring repentance than any words that can be uttered. Satan is well pleased when parents irritate their children by speaking harsh, angry words. You know, if your child is angry and you get angry, how much better are you than your child? Not worse. Because you should know better, right? Paul has given us a caution on this point. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. They may be very wrong, but you cannot lead them to the right by losing patience with them. Amen. Love breaks down all barriers. Let there be no scolding, no loud voice, angry commands. Be so calm, so free from anger, that they will be convinced that you love them, even though you punish them. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. 
Love is not irritable or resentful. Let not one word of fretfulness, harshness, or passion escape your lips. The grace of God awaits your demand. What is God waiting for? For you to submit and get what you need to keep patient and kind. The grace of God awaits your demand. His Spirit will take control of your heart and your conscience, presiding over your words and deeds. Never forfeit your self-respect by hasty, thoughtless words. Give your children an example of that which you wish them to be. If cross words fall from your lips, you are teaching your children to speak in the same way. See, we educate our children. The largest share of the annoyances of life, its heartache, its irritation, is the result of a temper uncontrolled. Isn't that true in the home? What causes the problems in the home? Impatience, irritation, a temper uncontrolled. Never should we lose control of ourselves. Let us ever keep before us the perfect pattern. It is a sin to speak impatiently and fretfully or to feel angry, even though we do not speak. Child Guidance 95. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. If you are abiding in Christ and Christ in you, you cannot speak angry words. Fathers and mothers, I beseech you for Christ's sake to be kind, tender, and patient in your home. Heavenly Places 99. When teaching the little ones to do things, we must not scold them. Never should we say, why did you not do this? Say, children, help mother do this. Come, children, let us do this. Be their companion in doing these things. When they finish their work, praise them. We're, of course, talking about little ones who find it so hard to do their little duties alone without mother right there working along with them. (coughs) An approving glance, a word of encouragement or commendation will be like sunshine in their hearts. My Life 173. Let the youth feel that they are trusted, and there are few who will not seek to prove themselves worthy of the trust. On the same principle, it is better to request than to command. The one thus addressed has opportunity to prove himself loyal to right principles. His obedience is the result of choice rather than compulsion. Request, rather than command. His obedience is then the result of choice, rather than compulsion. And that's what I did with my little girl, you see. If if she wanted to do something and I couldn't agree with it, I didn't command. I just said, let's pray about it. And in a day or so, she was willing to choose the right way because the Holy Spirit had been speaking to her. The object of discipline is the training of the child for self-government. What is the object of discipline? The training of the child for self-government. And because I did that with my little girl, and she was only 13, she was already 13 when I started, I hadn't started it when she was a baby, but even at that age, and because she saw that mom and dad had something she wanted, in just a year, she was wanting what we had. And she started to search. And when she was 14, she decided she had started, she was 15, she had started academy and there was so much sin in the dorm. She begged us to take her home. 
And I'm so thankful we did. Later on, we found out what some of the sins were, and they were really terrible. Especially two of her roommates and what they were doing. And so we were very thankful we listened to her cry, Take me out of here, Mom. I want to, I want to follow God. I don't want to get involved in this sin. And so we took her home. We just let her stay home for a whole year when she was 15. And she spent the whole year in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, just searching for an experience with God for herself. And by the time that year was over, she had made her decision, I'm all for God. And she had read messages to young people, and she came to us and she said, Mom, I just read messages to young people and all about dating and everything like that. And she says, for me, there's no dating until I'm 20. (laughs) I'm going to follow God's plan. And we had not one teenage problem with that little girl. Not one. She actually didn't start dating until she was 22 and she married the man she dated. And so she was kept free from all corruption. And later on, when she was 20, she told me, she said, Mom, aren't I lucky? All of the other kids have gone through so much trauma and heartache from one boyfriend to another, and I've been free all these years. What a blessing. And then when she was old enough to date, she and her boyfriend both dated in a very Christian way. Their dates were spending the time together studying the Word of God. And no uh, no private dating. With chaperones, the way I dated. You know, in our day, you have to have a chaperone. Today, we put the children, the children, on their own. How sad. How sad. The object of discipline is for is the training of the child for self government, and Lorna was self governed under God all through her teen years after she made her decision. In fact she would search out things and come and share with us some new things to follow in dress reform and all kinds of things. <clears throat> in order to be taught for self-government, it says, therefore, as soon as he is capable of understanding, his reason should be enlisted on the side of obedience. Not just command. His reason should be enlisted on the side of obedience. And if you do it with much prayer, the Holy Spirit will help him to reason it out correctly. Do you see? God can help us. But I didn't depend on the Holy Spirit when I was bringing up my older ones. Let all dealing with him be such as to show obedience to be just and reasonable. Help him to see that all things are under law. And that disobedience leads, in the end, to disaster and suffering. Education 287. Unless parents shall make it the first business of their lives to guide their children's feet into the path of righteousness from their earliest years, the wrong path will be chosen before the right. Why? Because easy is the way that leads into destruction. You know, some people say it's hard to be lost, easy to be saved, no way. Unless you find a living relationship with God, it is not easy to be saved. Ellen White says it's easy living after you are dead, dead to self. But to die to self, she says, is the hardest battle that man has to fight. And she says to surrender the will to God 
is like plucking out your eye and cutting off your right hand. Is that easy? And yet the surrender of the will is required before you can be justified. Before you enter the gate of the new birth. The earlier the will is made to yield to the will of the parents, and the more complete the submission, the less difficult it will be to yield to the requirements of God. So you see, right from tiny up, you can train that little child to willingly yield. Not through threatening. Train them to willingly yield. Because I always willingly yielded to my father and mother, I did not find it hard once I understood what it meant to yield my will to God. I did not find it hard to yield to my God. Mothers, be sure you properly discipline your children during the first three years of their lives. If these first lessons have been defective, as they very often are, for Christ's sake, for the sake of your children's future and eternal good, seek to repair the wrong you have done. Child Guidance 194. You should correct your children in love. Do not let them have their own way until you get angry and then punish them. Do we do that easily? Yes, we know. We see them going off a little bit. And we don't immediately get in there and pray for them and keep them lifted up. And so they, they go further and further and, and we may alert them, but they don't immediately obey. We don't take time to go and pray with them. And pretty soon we lose our patience and away we go, right? And we get angry. You should correct your children in love. Do not let them have their own way until you get angry and then punish them. Such correction only helps on the evil instead of remedying it. After you have done your duty faithfully to your children, carry them to God and ask him to help you. Tell him that you have done your part and then in faith ask God to do his part that which you cannot do. Ask him to temper their dispositions, to make them mild and gentle by his spirit. You see, only God can do that. He will hear you pray. He will love to answer your prayers. Disobedience must not be allowed. Sin lies at the door of the parents who allow their children to disobey. Child Guidance 85. Rules should be few and well considered, and when once made, they should be enforced. Whatever it is found impossible to change, the mind learns to recognize and adapt itself. But you see, if parents give in one day and not the next day, Then the children start into this begging um, framework, you see. And then you will be continually plagued. Because they know if they beg long enough, the parents will give in. I never allowed, and this is Ellen White talking, I never allowed my children to think that they could plague me in their childhood. I also brought up in my family others from other families. But I never allowed those children to think that they could plague their mother. Never did I allow myself to say a harsh word or to become impatient or fretful over the children. Why? Why did she never fail that way? She knew how to have the connection. That's why. And she knew God. And she knew God could work miracles in her heart and in her children's hearts. They never got the better of me once, not once, to provoke me to anger. 
When my spirit was stirred or when I felt anything like being provoked when she was tempted, I would say, children, we shall let this rest now. We shall not say anything more about it now. Before we shall retire, we shall talk it over. Having all this time to reflect, by evening they had cooled off and I could handle them very nicely. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. I never lifted a hand to my children before I talked with them. And if they broke down, and if they saw their mistake, and they always did when I brought it before them and prayed with them, and if they were subdued, and they always were when I did this, then I had them under my control. I never found them otherwise. When I prayed with them, they would break all to pieces and they would throw their arms around my neck and cry. And it says, if you can bring them to that kind of repentance, there is no need to punish them. We should pray to God much more than we do. There is great strength and blessing in praying together in our families with and for our children. When my children have done wrong and I've talked with them kindly and then prayed with them, I have never found it necessary after that to punish them. Their hearts would melt in tenderness before the Holy Spirit that came in answer to our prayers. Child Guidance 525 Do not become impatient with your children when they err. When you correct them, do not speak abruptly and harshly. This confuses them, making them afraid to tell the truth. Oh, how many parents have done that. From tiny up, they dealt so harshly. If a little child did wrong, that the children were afraid to tell the truth and they would hide their misdemeanors from mom and dad. And do you know what it says a father is to do every evening? He is to take his little family because he's the house band. And he is to take his little family and kneel before the altar of prayer. And he is to ask them, does anyone have anything to confess today? Is there anything between you and the Savior? Anything to make right? And if the children know he's going to deal gently with them, won't they confess? Children don't want guilty consciences. It bothers them terribly. And they know there's a barrier between them and the parent when they have a guilty conscience. But if the parents have dealt harshly, they're afraid to tell what they've done wrong. The Lord will not vindicate the misrule of parents. Today, hundreds of children swell the ranks of the enemy living and working apart from the purpose of God. They are disobedient, unthankful, unholy, but the sin lies at the door of their parents. Christian parents, thousands of children are perishing in their sins because of the failure of their parents to rule the home wisely. Child Guidance 182. And I just praise God every day that my children are not out there. My children are with me. We have sweet communion with our children. Here's another way that I failed my children, and I already talked about it. Not a particle of variance should be shown by parents in the management of their children. Now, if your husband or wife isn't a Christian, but you yourself then must keep to a steady line of whatever you are allowed to do in the home with your children. Not a particle of variance should be shown by parents in the management of their children. Parents are to work together as a unit. There must be no division. But many parents work at cross purposes and thus the children are spoiled by mismanagement. And I did that. 
I worked at cross purposes with my husband because he was harsh and selfish with the children and so I bent over to be indulgent. Was I wrong? Yes, I was. But I didn't know how to handle it. I wasn't reading. I wasn't studying. I didn't know God. And that's why we told our children we didn't know God. We were very open with it. We didn't know God. Can you forgive us? If parents do not agree, let them absent themselves from the presence of their children until an understanding can be arrived at. Review and Herald, March 30, 1897. And Matthew 12:25 says, No house divided against itself will stand. No house divided against itself will stand. And some of you who are married to unbelievers, pray for your unbelieving spouse because it's very likely you will lose your children unless, unless you have such a relationship with God and your children that they will draw nigh to you. Never let your child hear you say, I cannot do anything with you. It's an easy thing to say, isn't it? Blame the child. Blame the child. As long as you may have access to the throne of God, we as parents should be ashamed to utter such a word. Cry unto Jesus, and he will help you to bring up your little one. He will help you. Child Guidance 238. When an emergency arises, ask, Lord, what shall I do now? If you refuse, watch this carefully, if you refuse to fret or scold, the Lord will show you the way. But if you fret and scold, you see, you've allowed Satan now to control you, and you're not letting the Holy Spirit show you the way. He will help you to use the talent of speech in so Christ-like a way that peace and love will reign in the home. Counsels to Teachers 156 Fathers and mothers, when you can control yourselves, you will gain great victories in controlling your children. When you can control yourselves. Child Guidance 217. If you lose your temper, you forfeit that which no mother or father can afford to lose, the respect of their children. Never scold. Never permit scolding in the home. Never give your child a passionate blow unless you wish him to learn to fight. As parents, you stand in the place of God to your children, and you are to be on guard. Parents, never act from impulse. Never correct your child when you are angry, for if you do this, you will mold him after your image to be impulsive, passionate, and unreasonable. You can be firm without violent threatenings or scolding. Review and Herald. June 28, 1910. Children do not always discern right from wrong, and when they do wrong, they are often treated harshly. Have you ever done that? It's easy to do, isn't it? Instead of listening to them, immediately condemn them. Instead of realizing why they did wrong. However provoking your children may be in their ignorance, do not give way to impatience. Teach them patiently and lovingly. Be firm with them. Do not let Satan control them. Discipline them only when you are under the discipline of God. Child Guidance 245 This is your day of trust. 
your day of responsibility and opportunity. Soon will come your day of reckoning. Take up your work with earnest prayer and faithful endeavor. Teach your children it is their privilege to receive every day the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let Christ find you his helping hand to carry out his purposes. By prayer, you may gain an experience that will make your ministry for your children a perfect success. God is able to change things, isn't he? He is. If the Father's heart will turn to God, then he can turn the hearts of the children to the Father. Now, if you are a young person or an older person and your parents haven't turned to God, maybe you can turn the hearts of your parents to, your ch- to, to their children. How can you do that? Go to your father or mother, if you have found Jesus, and say, Mom and Dad, I have found a real relationship with Christ, and I now realize how many times I have failed you, how many times I've given you heartaches, how many times I I just wasn't obedient like I should have been. Whatever your problems were as you were growing up, confess them to your parents as though you were the chief offender. Remember we learned that? That's how to make confession. As though you were the chief offender. Even if they haven't done it, you do it. Because you see, you can hold no bitterness in your soul against your parents. Otherwise, you are not forgiven by God. And if you hold bitterness, how can you knock at the door of heaven and have him let let you in? You can't. No bitterness will be allowed in heaven. No resentment. And so you can do something, too, to melt the hearts of your parents and pray for them. God wants the Elijah message to go out turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father. Let's do our part to help him. Do you have any questions? We have a few minutes. Who are not family members, but who are friends of the family, are increased today than perhaps they were at Sister White's day? If you're a single parent and you can't stay with your children because you have to work, Ellen White had to work also. And she had to leave her children in the care of someone else. And she prayed that God would find her the right family to leave her first little baby. And many, many times she had to leave her children because God expected her to be on the road. And even when her last little child was born, she looked forward so much that maybe this winter God would let her stay home with her little one. But God let that little one die so she could be on the road. But that's been a wonderful blessing because Ellen White will be able to raise that little one in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? It's, it's not terrible that he took that little one. He needed her to do the work he had given her to do. But he's going to give her back that little one to raise without sin. Yes. Would you, uh, we've been talking about health reform and along with, uh, praying with your children, bringing them to God, would you elaborate on what Ellen White said about the indulgence of appetite in children, small children, and what it does to them spiritually? Because we see here and in our Adventist church children that are constantly eating and drinking 24 hours a day. They eat and drink in church, and then they can't have any concept of spirituality. Could you elaborate on that? Um, <clears throat> constantly eating and drinking does becloud the mind. 
And that's important for parents, too. But just concentrating on eating right foods and drinking at proper times and eating at proper times will not make you a Christian. It can help your body to be more easily controlled, but um, even always eating right and always drinking right and doing everything right, uh, you still need the Holy Spirit to control your temper and to control your impatience and all of that. It will not come automatically just because you eat right and you don't eat flesh foods and all of this kind of stuff. It will not come automatically. This is Davis. And so the concentration must always be number one. And, of course, when number one is taken care of, this will also be taken care of in every home Amen. because they will follow the guidelines. Mrs. Davis, I, I just want to say that the whole message that I have heard this week is that I don't want people to misinterpret what they are hearing as far as how you react to a question like that, that you are not in any way opposed to the reforms that we no. have in the spirit of prophecy. No. But from what I have heard from you personally and also in public, you have been involved in so much of getting people off of the, ex getting their eyes, that this, you can get totally caught up in the exteriors of the thing. That's right. And that all that you're stressing is, you know, like Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, all these things that you do are good, yes. but don't leave the other undone. That's right. And what you're That's saying, right. yes, all of these things are good, but work from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in the ex exteriors. <clears throat> so I, I want to make sure that right. nobody is saying or thinking that uh, you don't believe in all I of these. I believe in reform, yeah. but not extreme reform. But I also know that there are certain people who depend on those things to build their character. Character is built by Jesus Christ. Amen. Character is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful balance. I had a question concerning the single parent thing again. Um, like there's been a lot of, you know, broken homes, broken homes around. And um, I have a, I, maybe it's my lack of faith, I guess, to me. Let me just go ahead and say that because sometimes I look at my children and they're with their parents, they're with their, you know, their, their mothers and they're unbelievers, they're out in the world and it really hurts me and, and, and I know I've made mistakes in, in the past that my kids have to suffer for now and that's why they're in the position they're in now and, and I'm always in prayer over this and asking the Lord to deliver yeah. them and I guess I just got to be patient and You've got to be patient, right? right? And keep praying and keep loving them and keep dealing with them when you have them in a very gentle, loving way and, and depend a lot on prayer. <coughs> and We've also got to realize in these situations that they didn't arise overnight and they're not going to be resolved no. overnight. It's going to be a painful process of the Lord being able to untangle That's right. the tangled webs that we weave by our life yes. of sin. And that takes, that takes that takes time. 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 Uh, it took my boy six years before he was ready to surrender to God. I, I got another one here too about um, like I'm a, I'm a new Christian, okay, and and it's just now been about a, about a month ago. It's really been hit me about being an overcomer and camp meeting helped out a lot, and and, and you and it's all you know starts to hit home and everything, and. Was I that cold before when I, that, that, that the guilt, <laughs> you know, that the guilt, I just, you know, I, I, did, I, did I give it to the Lord and forget what was my problem where I didn't, wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit or was he, you know, what, why, I, why I got the guilt now that I listened to you that before I just gave it to the Lord. <laughs> and what, what an honest man. You, you know, can you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I think I thought I was right with the Lord before, and I was striving all the time. Like God taught me, strive for perfection, strive, strive, strive. And but did you have the Holy Spirit controlling your spirit? Not all. See, there's see, I was, the I was lukewarm. There's the problem. And and I know that now. I'm lukewarm. Yeah. And I thought I was on fire for the Lord because I just thought I had to keep yes. striving for it. But I we've kept all been that way, way, brother. We've all been there. Yes, yes. We've all gone through that because nobody taught us how to really be a living Christian. 
Amen. So, and the reason I didn't teach him is because I didn't know. So, so you know, <laughs> we're all learning here, folks. Amen. So, wh- wh- where did that guilt? Where did I put that guilt? Where did I put it? Where did I place it? In the back somewhere? Or why is it right up front now saying, well, I have to do something? Well, because now you know what to do. And so he's convicting you. There is more to Christianity than what you thought. But he couldn't, he couldn't make you feel all guilty before because no one had taught you, see? Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I think there's some hands over here. Okay, we've been asked to have them stand so we can get it on the video. Go ahead and stand. Turn to, turn to the side there. Okay. Yes, I would like to ask, uh, what is the counsel on fasting with children? Uh, if any, uh, because I know with me and my family, we came together as a family. We like call a family meeting, and we sat together and we talked and prayed about it, and we agreed upon whatever period to come together as a family to fast. The fasting and praying is something that we are exhorted to do, but according to Ellen White, um, not necessarily the children, and even our fasting is largely to be eat very lightly that day. Eat very lightly that day that you are fasting. Uh, Abstaining from food again is not going to make you a Christian. The scribes and Pharisees fasted all the time and it didn't make them Christians. Yes. And they were proud of their fasting. It is all right to fast one day a week. And, and even there, uh, it does not have to be a total fast, according to the spirit of prophecy. We're told that our general fast today is to obey the laws and the doctrines yes. that the Lord has given. Yes. Yes. All right. Another one? Here. It's time for us to close. Well, we're going to fudge a little ten- <laughs> tonight. I'm sorry with you. Uh, you said that when uh, Ellen White goes into heaven, she can raise her child with her. You can actually, I mean, you to be a family yes. in heaven? Yes. And, you uh, will know your family members. Yes. And one other thing is, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, and I've had the, the God shoved down my throat, you know, and, and uh, that's about as nice as I could put it compared to what I've been through. And I made a solemn swear that I would never bring my child to a church as long as I lived. And, and I like to thank God that I've, I've seen the truth and found it and I'm able to to, go, to humble down and go to it. You know? Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Yes, shoving, shoving religion down children's throats is worthless. It doesn't make them Christians. Yes. I guess my question before was, and you, I didn't say it right, was can you expect your children to be subdued and the Holy Spirit to enter them when you, by allowing them to indulge themselves, when their their spirit is is willful, willfully physically unable to comprehend anything spiritual while you're indulging them, that's my question. No, that's why I said if you are walking with the Lord, you will not let your children indulge themselves. Amen. You will not. But I just I what I wanted to get across is that does not make them patient and kind necessarily. Even if they eat three meals a day only and never eat between meals, they could still be very hyper. <laughs> I thought we had time on the tape, but I, they just told me we had three minutes on the on the tape, so I guess we better bring it to a close. Uh, I hope you folks get these get these tapes, because we're going to make them available just as low as we possibly can, just right at our cost, because we want you folks to have these. We want to put these things out like the leaves of, leaves of autumn. So... Uh, have you folks looked around and seen the crowd we have tonight? In case you those appear in the front, do you see? I mean, this 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 looks like church, you know. And I am so thrilled. We have more. We have more tonight than we did the first night. I mean, uh, it's just incredible to see how that we've been getting more and more each night, Sister Davis. And give all the credit to the Lord and this wonderful message that the Lord has given you to present to us. And I'm so thrilled as a pastor to see these people accepting this message. And uh, we've, 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 got to, we've got to stay in touch with you. <laughs> stay in touch. 
Amen. God. Well, I think that's established. Every one of us. I think that's yeah. established. Brother Hector, would you come up and lead us in prayer and as we close out the meeting on this beautiful Sabbath evening?